Welcome everyone and thank you for uh, attending my lecture. This paper represents my work in progress on rabbinic emotions. Uh, I'm mapping the emotionality found in rabbinic literature, not only regarding one or another emotion, but uh, what is the emotional system which is reflected in this literature. I'm only presenting here a small uh, segment of this research, of course. I'm not looking for our emotions in the rabbinic literature, in whatever way it may appear, such as in narratives, for example. Uh, this was done by other scholars, and it is a perfectly, perfectly good way of learning about uh, emotions in rabbinic culture. But I'm taking a different way. As rabbinic culture does not have one word for the concept of emotions, I look in my research into words that are possible candidates for referring to what we cluster as emotions. As other scholars have already realized and said, and some of them are present here, these words do not indicate emotions as we think of them, but are a combination of an action with an attitude or with an intention. Emotions are inseparably tied with the body in rabbinic literature, in, the, in ancient cultures, but of course also, also today. So let me first say something shortly about emotions and emotions and embodiment, and then look into one word, one root, that may fall into what we cluster as emotions. So while emotions do have a strong bodily element, yeah, they're embodied, but their origin is in the brain. It is the brain that coordinates the bodily reaction to, the, to a stimulus to make it an emotional event. The stimulus could be external, like sensory uh, stimulus, or internal with regard to what is the situation of the body, and then it is called uh, in interception. In the bi biological domain, in neurological studies, there's not completely unanimity regarding emotions, but I will stick here to uh, one approach and its terminology. Yeah, so the model I'm using is um, James Russell's circumplex model of affect. The two main concepts used in this uh, system are uh, valence and affect. The term valence is used to refer to the inherently pleasant or unpleasant quality of, of the stimulus. Is it attractive? Uh, is it attracting or is it repelling? The term affect is the general sense of feeling, sensation, um, gut feeling, intuition that we experience throughout the day. Yeah, this is constant. We always have it. The characters of this affect are its level of arousal, is it high arousal or low arousal? Uh, and this is expressed as being agitated when it's high or calm when it's low. So here is um, yeah, here is uh, Russell's uh, model. As you can see, you have the, the uh, horizontal uh, line, which is uh, uh, represents the valence. Is it pleasant or un unpleasant? It's a continuum, it's not a dichotomy. And then the vertical um, pole is uh, the arousal level, where at the top it's high arousal and then the organism is uh, highly active. And at the bottom it's low arousal and then the, the organism is um, non-active. Uh, and as you see, there are um, all kinds of emotions uh, um, distributed throughout uh, this model. We, we are not interested in these emotions per se, because we want to look into the core of this. You know, we, 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 we will find the emotions that we are looking for, uh, which is this, yeah? activated, deactivated on the arousal pole and uh, unpleasant or pleasant on the valence uh, so equipped with only these two variables, as, to, as opposed to other theories that enumerate various emotions, we are free to listen to what the rabbinic culture recognizes as emotions and what the texts offer. 
Yeah, further, as typical with the rabbinic literature, one should relate to the distinction between Palestinian and Babylonian uh, section of the culture, to the periodization in general, you know, Tanaitic, Amoraic, and later, and to the differentiation between halachic and agadic uh, literature. I will mainly relate to the latter distinction, Agada and halacha. Halachic uh, language tends to be more precise with the way it uses terminology, including emotional terminology, it, because it is its role to make the distinction and to be accurate about um, the things that it talks about. So the word I want to talk about today, or the root I want to talk about today, is the root ma'as. The word uh, ma'as in Hebrew is translated as rejection, contempt in yastrov, uh, aversion, kal, or reject, refuse, etc. in Keller and Baumgarten, and tiuv, iratzon, loathing, and reluctance in the Hebrew Historical Dictionary Project uh, of the Academy of the Hebrew Language, but we also find the, the translation abundant. Much of the rabbinic discourse about this word revolves around the root in conjunction, conjunction with uh, Torah or mitzvah, commandment, often in the context of uh, the verse from Leviticus, im bechukotai tim asu, where the word despise is translating the root ma'as in the King James Version. And there's a famous halachic uh, expression, muktse mechamat mi'us, which is usually translated as loathsome. I found that the, the, the Hebrew Historical Dictionary's translation as abundant is much more similar to the rabbinic usage of this uh, root in the examples that I'm going to bring now. Example number one talks about a horse. There are six characteristics of a horse. One of them is that the horse moes sleep. This statement is found in uh, Psikta de Rav Kahana, so this is the classical period of rabbinic literature. It is hard to think of loathing or despising as a proper translation here. It should be closer to something like not interested or does not do much, so closer to abundant, not engaged with. Uh, as this uh, verse probably refers to the, the slumber of horses, yes, the, the very short sleep that they do standing up throughout the day. Number two is from uh, a Tanaitic text, Sifreo Numbers. It talks about God not moes, not um, yeah, doing this thing of the verb, in uh, the prayer of the many, but in this, uh, the context is that God does not adhere to Moses' supplication, but for the many, he would not do this. Here also the context uh, has nothing to do with, with uh, loathing and ignoring uh, makes uh, more sense. God does not ignore the prayer of the many. The text number three, intertext with the verse Even Masua Bonim, the stone which the builders rejected becomes the, the chief cornerstone from Psalms. It is fr uh, from uh, Pirke de Rabbi Eliezer, so a relatively late text. It tells that Abram, the, you know, the, the context is that uh, Abram cursed the people who were building the Tower of Babel, asking God to confound their language. But they, the people, they ma'asu his words like a stone in the field. Here again, lo loathing would not make sense, but ignoring does. They were wrong to ignore Abram's curse, since, as we know already, confounding the language is exactly what happened to them in the end. So it was their mistake to, uh, to ma'as, to ignore his uh, curse. So equipped with uh, this new understanding of uh, Limos, let us look at a new at... Um, at other texts. The first one, um, from a later Midrash, the Song of Songs Rabbah, tells that the Egyptians, Ma'asu, yeah, I will call it uh, ignore or disengaged, the Israelites in Egypt. 
And then they were surprised to see how uh, king-like the Israelites have become and regretted that uh, uh, regretted sending them away. So it is not that the Israelites were despised, according to our new understanding. Uh, it's not that they were despised in Egypt, but that they were simply ignored. So this is a, a new understanding. It's not that the Israelites were uh, repulsive to the Egyptians, which has no actually sense in this context, but just that they were ignored, they were transparent, they were uh, no one saw them. Uh, the second case uh, is from Psikta de Kahana, again, uh, the classical period, relates to a verse from Lamentation. If you have utterly rejected us and is exceedingly angry with us, and the rabbinic text here, regardless of the, the whole context, is making the distinction between ma'os and katsof, yeah, the two verbs the, from the verse, if it is anger, then one can return from the anger, which entails that if one ignores or moes, they cannot return from this. Yeah, so th this is why I find that the word disengage represents this case, uh, this verb better. It is something that once you psychologically disengage from, you will never return to it. Yeah, it's out of your sphere of meaningful things. The third example, from Siktar de Rav Kahana again, says that God is ready to give up, apparently to forgive, the three cardinal sins of idol worshipping, illicit sex, or murder, but he's not ready to give up levater ma'os the Torah, the disengagement from the Torah. So the, the Torah uh, means uh, halacha, the, the rabbinic understanding of the Torah. And this this is more serious if one ignores it or disengages from it or is indifferent to it than if one performs uh, one of the cardinal sins. So this example or this issue will be a bit important uh, toward the, uh, in my conclusions. Now let's move on to uh, a peek at some halachic uh, context of this uh, new understanding of this verb. Case number one is from the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, the f uh, it talks about wine, which was defiled by uh, by some uh, by holy wine that unintentionally dripped uh, on it in the storage place. So holy wine, in the sense that wine that was being uh, set aside to be brought to the temple, and it, it should not be touched. So if this drips over other wine, it is. Um, the other wine, the ordinary wine, gets defiled, so to speak. So the or ordinary wine now cannot uh, be used, and this causes a great uh, loss to the owner. By way of reducing this loss, the rabbis suggest that uh, it can be used as a wine that is poured over fire, not to be drunk, but to be poured over fire, apparently for a purpose of yeah, making a nice smell or something like this. Uh, for this purpose, the wine has to be aged, and this means that it has to be put in the storage place for a long time. So what to do uh, so that no one will uh, ever touch it, yeah? so that the owner will pre prevent the owner from touching it accidentally. The owner should put it in a vessel which is ma'us, which is, yeah, again, using this verb, which is disregarded, yeah? Dis disengaged. Meaning a vessel that is never regarded, it's never seen, it's never used, and that there's no chance that it will ever be used. So this is the klima us. This sheds light also on the, the expression of muktse mechamat mi us. Uh, as you can see here, the modern understanding uh, of it is of something that is rejected because it is disgusting or repulsive. But apparently, this expression refers to a vessel which is out of touch, not being touched because it fell out of grace, so to speak. The second example uh, is from the Yerushalmi. It talks about food items that are eaten by a worker. Yeah, the person is working for another person uh, around food things, and the worker eats some of the food. And the question is whether this food that is being eaten should be 
tithed or not. The situation pictured here is that the worker has the food in his mouth. And the question is, should be tithed or not? And the answer is that it should not be tithed. tithed mm. And it is reasoned with the word ma'us because it should not be tithed because it is ke ma'us, as, as ma'us, which of course can be thought of as it should not be tithed because it is repulsive, it is in somebody's mouth. But I think that the right understanding is is not that it is disgusting or repulsive, but because it is lost. It is something that is irrelevant anymore. It cannot be returned. Yeah, We saw briefly that maos is something that cannot be returned. And I think this is the point here. It's not that he can you can decide that it should be tithed and, and then the, the owner forces the person to take it out of his mouth in order to tithe, tithe it. Yeah, so that's not the case. It is lost. So now we move to a very interesting uh, um, text from uh, Sifra, uh, which talks about uh, mental states of people and their action. And it includes uh, the, the, the root that we are interested in, the, the root Maos. In Sifra, this is an early Midrash on Leviticus, Tanaitic, we have a list of negative characteristics of a person, midot, midot yeah, organized in an uh, increasing order, advancing toward the utmost evil, which is a person being kofer uh, baika, denying the essence. Uh, the text is formulated as uh, questions and answers, typical to this uh, midrash, and it includes uh, proof verses for each uh, step of the argument, indicated. Uh, in red here, uh, even though you don't see the whole text, but the red is, is the verses. Uh, I will only summarize the sequence here. So this is so uh, this is the text. If one does not learn the commandments, one does not do them. And if one does not do them, one moes, I should say, is uh, disengaged from others who do them. And as a result, one hates the sages, and then one does not let others do them, the, the commandments. Then one does not acknowledge that the commandments were said in Sinai, and eventually such a person will deny the core, the ancients, kofer baikav. So uh, this is the text. This is just a list of the things. If one learns, apparently uh, what the rabbis called mitzvot, referring to rabbinic halacha, then one does not do them, practice uh, rabbinic halacha. It then follows that the person will not engage, so he, the person will disengage from the people who do this halacha. This is our verb ma'as. And since when a person is disengaged from the mitzvot, indifferent to them, uh, a person will hate the rabbis. And the hate here means... Uh, one that distances himself from uh, from the rabbis, as um, Gerabov uh, showed in his study of the word sonne um, in, in rabbinic literature. So the person will distance himself from the rabbis who, who teach the commandments, who teach the mitzvot. And if a person distances himself from the rabbis, the person will not let, in a, in a sense of enable, others to do the mitzvot as, as well. And following this, the rabbis say, the person will eventually deny that the halakha and mitzvot are from Sinai, and lastly, will be uh, will deny God, will be kofer baika, as we understand it. So while the verb ma'as is not really an emotion, it is more of a tempered affective situation, let's say low or medial arousal effect of negative valence, it is an important affective state of which the rabbis are aware and about which they have uh, a strong opinion. One should not be uh, disengaged from the halakha or from the Torah. One should be engaged. We saw the importance of it also in the text, which said that God overlooks cardinal sins, but does not overlook disengagement from the Torah. This now puts this understanding from Psikta de Rav Kahana in, in a wider context. So to conclude, 
And to conceptualize what we found uh, in a bit wider uh, scope, I can say the following. From studying the verb limos to disengage, we saw that the rabbis are aware of affective states of people and they promote cer certain um, affective uh, states. Not to say demand, I don't say that they demand. After all, it is not completely clear uh, what level of social, social authority the rabbis had, and it surely differed throughout time and geographical location. Uh, in an article from 2009, Stephen Weitzman used the term emotional mobilization, and he talked in this article about the, 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 the war, in the war scroll in, in, uh, in uh, the Maccabean rebellion, in, in Maccabees 1 and 2, and the use of religion to create emotional mobilization. So to make the, mo the soldiers more motivated and, uh, and, and tuned to fight. We don't see this here in this rabbinic literature. Surely we don't talk about an army, uh, we talk about a civil society. So what we find in rabbinic emotional discourse is awareness and promotion in a deontic manner, yeah, in the manner of being an obligation, a demand to be engaged. In this respect, the rabbis are creating an, creating an engaged society, mm -hmm. and this results in a society which is committed to the culture, rabbinic culture in this case. Many of us in the humanities are using the concept emotional community or communities coined by Barbara Rosenwein to um, describe our um, our ancient societies. This refers to a social group that shares emotionality, but also values and behavior. So overall, this is a good concept, even though the word emotional here uh, upgrades it beyond what I find comfortable. After all, in many cases, we talk about affective situations in which the, the arousal is not so high. It's not a real emotion. I would therefore find that the concept used in the psychology affective niche is um, more convenient. Also because I haven't given up on the biological aspect of emotions, the, the cognitive aspect of it, and I would like to keep uh, the connections with the sciences of the mind. It is used there to describe the uh, emotional sphere around an individual. So in order to indicate that it is not psychological, but cultural, uh, I would talk about socio-affective uh, socio niche, which refers to the whole society. And this is what the rabbis discuss, uh, worry about and promote or dispromote, since the socio-affective niche is what creates eventually cultural commitment. Thank you very much for listening and I'm looking forward to uh, the discussion.